Thank you for joining us. I'm Joanna Stern. I am a columnist, a senior personal technology columnist at The Wall Street Journal. And I write columns and do videos about tech, all sorts of tech, really about how it impacts your life. And I'm very excited to be joined by two wonderful Stanford, Stanford professors here today. We have Rob Reich and Mehran, Mehran Sahani. Mm -hmm. Is that right there? Yep. Yes. OK. And we're going to do something a little, little unconventional. They're going to introduce each other because they are co-authors of a book and they know each other far better than I know them. Hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm going to introduce my colleague and friend, Maron, here. We've been teaching a class together for the past five or six years, and we wrote this book together called System Error. Maron is a computer scientist. He has a PhD from Stanford, and then he went and spent uh, 10 years working in on the tech industry. Um, you wouldn't know his name, but you, you want to be grateful to Maron, because while he worked at Google, he was one of the lead people to develop email spam filtering technology. <laughs> He left Google a little over 10 years, ago, 10 years ago to come back to Stanford, and he's been a pioneer um, in the computer science department for two reasons. Um, first, he completely reconfigured the curriculum for undergraduate students that helped con convert the undergraduate major in computer science to the largest major in the university right now, um, largest major for men, largest major for women. The introduction to computer science class that Maron built um, often has between 700 and 1,000 people in it, um, not by requirement. Uh, and so um, he has personally instructed about 60% of the past decade of Stanford University undergraduates, which is an incredible small factoid. Um, he's now additionally the chair of the Stanford Computer Science Department, and so he's uh, garlanded with many honors and uh, a great friend and colleague. Well, thanks, Rob. The, that's really too kind of you and too generous. Uh, this is my colleague, Rob Reich, who is the newly minted McGregor and Girard uh, Chair of Social Ethics and Science and Technology, which is one of the highest honors that the university bestows on someone. Um, and he's having a good week. I mean, just earlier, actually, in the week, he met with President Biden to talk about ethics and technology. So pretty good week to have. Um, he's a professor in the political science department, but at the same time, also a professor in the Department of Philosophy. Uh, Rob is actually well known known as a moral philosopher, especially in issues around technology and science. He's also the associate director of the Human Centered AI Institute on campus, which is looking at AI broadly from a variety of different standpoints across disciplines. And he's also the director of the McCoy Center for Ethics that is actually the main hub on campus that brings ethical thinking across to all students. And part of this class that we do together actually came from that center wanting to have more ties with the rest of campus, especially with science and technology. Um, if, and you'll see in the, you know, from Rob speaking today, when we teach together, uh, the students are enthralled. He has a way of being able to not only challenge students and get them to think, but get them to really understand the real consequences of their action in the world. And one of the things I often see is students coming back to thank him for the way he's actually shaped their thinking in terms of the long-term trajectory of their career. So fantastic to work with him. I should have had one of you guys introduce me. That's right, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right. I want to start with a phrase that everyone in Silicon Valley knows, and I'm assuming many people in our audience know, which is move fast and break things. Mm -hmm. This has been the, the long mantra of Silicon Valley. I wanted, and, I, and as I've read your book, you know, a lot of things have been broken. A lot of yeah. things have been broken. What has been broken? Right, so this, this mantra that you know, often was on posters in many of the different companies at, at Facebook in particular, move fast and break things. Iterate quickly, get your minimum vial of product out to market, um, learn from what happens in the marketplace and keep going. And combined with the venture capital funding model for tech companies in which the venture capitalists want to um, see that proverbial hockey stick of growth that you get you know, as quickly to scale as possible in order that you lock in a kind of marketplace position. Um, and you can deal with the social consequences if they're negative downstream, but try try just to push your product out as quickly as possible. So after, you know, if you think of the social media age as now maybe 10, 15 years old, um, we're now all well aware, I think, of a number of the you know, charitably put unintended consequences of some of the most familiar technology products and platforms, and I'll just tick them off as, yeah, as various things have been broken. So um, algorithmic models that have bias built into them, so whether it's in hiring or credit scoring or criminal justice or 
any variety of places in which algorithmic models are being used, we should worry about whether various forms of bias have been baked into the models. Secondly, the business model of so many tech companies is to give the product away for free in return for suctioning up a whole bunch of your data and in certain respects violating some expectations of privacy for all of us who either um, you know, use the internet or use a whole bunch of the apps on our phones. Third, with respect to automation, automation in the workplace has been responsible for the displacement of many people who are human workers and instead has been converted into either robots or various forms of machine aided, aided labor. And then fourth and finally, and especially in this um, um, age of AI in the past year, um, the social media platforms are riddled with misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, which gets algorithmically amplified. It's an incredible forum for all people to have a voice, yet at the same time, it pollutes our information ecosystem and makes it far more difficult to have a healthy way of exchanging ideas with each other. So. In the language of an economist, we view all of these various problems, the things that have been broken, as negative externalities. In the same way, like a chemical company that's sited next to a river will dump its pollution into the stream. In the absence of various forms of regulation or industry standards that get you to internalize those negative externalities, the incentive structure for the companies continues to be to cause all these harms even as everyone's aware of them. The business model for a company that suctions all your data is that's where they make their money from, so they don't have any huge incentive inside of it to be more privacy protecting. Same thing with misinformation, disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the standard issue things that have been broken. Just a few. Just a few. Just a few things. And now it's time to wake up and try to collectively do something about that. And it, it almost feels like we'd also bucket those into a couple of, of single words, democracy, yes. humanity. Yes. Those things feel a little broken, they possibly do. by tech. They do. Okay. Maron, I, I, and Rob answered a little bit of this, but what has caused, I mean, fundamentally, and this is the thesis of the book, what caused this? So there's a few things that caused that. One of the things that we see now is, you know, Congress call, calls up the CEOs of these companies. So Sundar Pinchai comes in, Mark Zuckerberg comes in, Tim Cook comes in. They have some hearings. Mostly what those hearings reveal is how little Congress actually knows about technology and how to regulate it. But they haul these folks in kind of as a show with an expectation that suddenly things are going to change. And one of the things we try to unpack in the book is this is not, the situations that have arisen are not the result of individual CEOs making decisions. They're the results of systemic drivers that cause these things to happen. And so even if there were different people running these companies, we would see pretty much the same effects. And so one of these systemic drivers is the rush toward optimization. And the fact that when you think of things from a computing standpoint, oftentimes what we do is we try to think about optimizing something. There's something we want to maximize. There's something we want to get higher. These are the metrics that companies measure. So if you think of a company like Facebook, its stated mission is to connect the world. Well, what does it mean to connect the world? How do you measure a business that's supposed to connect the world? The way they do that is they have a bunch of metrics like the time people spend on platform, the number of things they click on, the amount of revenue generated, the number of ads in the system. These are all poor proxies for the notion of connecting the world. Why? Because people tend to actually click on content that is inflammatory, that is titillating, that is more likely to get them to engage, which doesn't necessarily mean they're connecting people in a good way. All it means is that they're generating click through. But if that's the thing you're measuring and that's the thing you're trying to optimize, what you get essentially is an incentivization toward this abhorrent kind of behavior or information that percolates to the top of people's news feeds because that's the thing that actually drives these different metrics. And so part of the issue that we raise is when you think about the definition of these metrics, when companies put them in, from their standpoint, this is how they measure things. What they're getting as a result, and this is one of the things that we actually show in our class, is if you take something like a very simple social network and you say, what I want to do is maximize click-through rate in there. And Everyone is friends, so we're not going to assume any kind of polarization to begin with, but there are some people who are slightly more left-leaning in terms of their news habits, some that are slightly more right-leaning, and you just run the algorithm to maximize click-through rate, and the network breaks in half. Hmm. Everyone lives in their own world. So there's these systemic drivers that actually cause these problems to happen, not just you know, a CEO making a proclamation. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask you both this, but... Is there any incentive for these companies to, to change, to do any, to, to do the right thing? 
Well, I think they would say that if they lose the trust of their users or if they find various, if they're doing various things that cause significant harms in the world and there's a kind of regulatory um, reaction that harms their business model, they might have a long-term incentive to try to make various changes. But all in all, if you continue to take money from the way that you've currently rolled out your product, there's no internal incentive. I'd add to that something that I think it's important to understand um, at the same time, especially in this current moment of mania around artificial intelligence, especially no, we're going these, there. We're going these there. chat GPT models. Good. <laughs> um, uh, uh, computer science is a really young discipline. It, it didn't exist in universities to study until the 1950s and 1960s, and people who studied it were relatively uncommon. Um, artificial intelligence as a thing to focus on is really only 20 or 30 years old in which studying it gave you any power in the world. And now all these main companies with AI being infused everywhere have made people who do artificial intelligence amongst the most powerful people in the universe. And yet this disciplinary call it immaturity. Um, computer science is developmentally an immature field um, compared to biomedical research, compared to the law, compared to so many other professions that have been around a long time. So the, the kind of image I want to offer you to think about artificial intelligence developers, people in the company, the technologists, it's like they're 19 year olds. They've recently become aware of how powerful they are, but their frontal cortex is completely underdeveloped and they're socially irresponsible. <laughs> and so one of our tasks is to accelerate the developmental maturity of people who study computer science so they can internalize yeah. some of the responsibilities for developing technical ways of limiting some of the harms. And then, of course, we also have to have our policymakers get in the game, and I'm sure we're going to get to that, too. So you're sort of the equivalent of high school teachers. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. You want to be like, let's get the CS people to their late 20s as soon as possible. And that was one of the questions I had for both of you, which is, and Maren, we can start with you, but you have these students in your class. You're, you're teaching them these things, and then I'm assuming most of them do go to big tech companies, or they start new tech companies. Is there progress there? Do you, do you feel inspired by your students? Yeah, so we actually do ask them, you know, what do you want to do? How is this class or the material you've learned actually impact how you think about long term? And there's a distribution, as you would imagine. On one end of the distribution, we actually get some students who give us feedback, like, this has changed my life. It's changed the direction of what I want to do, the actual course I want to pursue, who I want to work for, et cetera. On the other end of the spectrum, you do get some students who say, thanks, that was nice. That's not changing anything. <laughs> And then you get a large majority that are in the center that basically say what it's given me is more to think about and consider and issues to bring up at the places that I go, which is really one of the things that we want to hope for. That what we think about in the broad scale is over time, what we want to do is shift the thinking in how software is developed. And there's a history in that. Like if you look at you know, the early days of software development, people hacked stuff together. And then companies realized like at some point, we need to test the software. We need to have a quality assurance team in the company that actually tests the software. Well, if you years later, people realized user interface was a big thing, so they added user interface teams. A few years later, especially with the advent of the internet, people realized computer security was a big thing. So no serious software house doesn't have a computer security team. What we'd like to see is kind of a fourth generation in that development, which is companies taking seriously as part of the software development process, social responsibility, and the impact of their products at a social level, and bake that into the process the same way we think about engineering good interfaces and security and testing products. Can are there any companies doing that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so they're, they're not at the point where the, we'd really like to see it baked in. We're seeing different companies actually take different approaches, like some have responsible AI teams or trust and safety teams. Um, to be honest, in this, this round of layoffs that happened just yep. a few months ago, we've seen some shakeups there where some of those teams actually got gutted. Yep. So that's the place where we're trying to see, like, are they really going to walk the walk? in the long term, what resources are they going to put into it, that remains to be seen. I just want to add a little story about, about the kinds of students we see. So if you, if you roll back in time seven or eight years, so I, I, I knew about Meron on campus, but we hadn't started working together. And at this point, um, for my perch in the, in the political science department, what I saw was students voting with their feet to go major in computer science and record numbers and the sort of standard issue decline of the humanities, decline of the social sciences that we hear about in different universities. So I was teaching a freshman class. It was in the fall semester, so the students have only been on campus for a couple weeks. I'm meeting with a lovely 
18 year old in my office and I'm making small talk, welcome to the university, tell me what you're thinking of studying. And he said, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be at Stanford University. I'm for sure gonna major in computer science. I'm gonna take the <laughs> class on venture capital. I mean, the people from Sand Hill Road are down here on campus half the time anyway. I can't wait to focus on AI. I've got startup ideas. So I sort of, you know, I'm a, you cried. I'm a philosopher, I'm crying. You He's cried. like barely arrived on campus. Maybe you should like explore some more of the campus, a liberal arts orientation here, not just a technical school. And, and he said, but you know, but I have these startup ideas. And I said, well, right, well what, what are your startup ideas? And the 18 year old looked at me in the face sincerely and earnestly and said, I'd be happy to tell you, professor, but first I have to ask you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, Already at 18 years old, like he's so vocationally oriented. And, and, and I felt like, all right, it's time for me, the philosopher, to wander over to the engineering quad in order to you know, stage a cultural intervention on campus <laughs> of a kind. Um, if I had taught a class on ethics and technology on my own, I would have gotten you know, 50, 60 people in it maybe. But teaching with Maron, this legendary presence on campus, teaching the introduction to, class in the, to computer science, teaching together has meant that we built a whole vocabulary and architecture where we're really trying to um, champion, as, as Maron put it, a kind of professional standards for guaranteeing social assurance of technology, not just quality assurance of the code base, but social assurance so that its effects in the wider world are far more easily predictable. And then we can harness the great benefits of technology because we are not doomsayers. Computer science and AI is bringing about all kinds of positive things which we should celebrate and champion, but we have to also attend to the risk. And in that respect, it's kind of or, and not especially rocket science to think about this. All kinds of other fields have had great benefits and also some risks. And we find ways to try to contain the risks. And that's the moment we're at with AI in particular. Well, you, perfect segue because that's where I wanted to go next. Yep. How many people here in the room have heard about AI this week? <laughs> AI oh, just, all the time. Just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. Okay. Your book came out in 2021 a step before this big AI revolution. But as I was reading it, I kept thinking, oh wow, this not only does it need to be updated, but this is a very good blueprint for what is happening right now. Right. You, don't, you have some chapters in there that mention this, but what is your outlook on AI right now? And as it applies to what we've heard here about your thesis about optimization and move fast, are we seeing anything different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that's happened that's, you know, between, say, two years ago and now is the consumer awareness of AI, right? So ChatGPT put a tool that actually is a pretty powerful AI tool in the hands of consumers to play with. Now, the truth is you've had AI impacting your life for probably the last 30 years or so. It just wasn't in ways that were in your face and you actually saw it, right? There's when you run your credit card through, you know, a transaction machine, someone somewhere has to decide whether or not that transaction goes through. The volume is way too large for human beings to make that decision. So computers have been making that decision for years. There's, for years now, computers have been res uh, screening people's resumes, making decisions about who gets access to credit, for example, for a mortgage, things like that. Um, so what's happened now is these power tools have been made available to users. It's opened up, the large language models have opened up a whole new class of possibilities for what can happen in terms of actually generating text. And so that's raised a lot of alarm bells, right? Because we see what the possible downsides are, what the possible benefits are, but it exacerbates all the issues that Rob talked about, right? It exacerbates the issue of data because whose data is used to actually build those models. It exacerbates the issue of privacy because some of these models can actually leak data about things that are private that people have posted in certain forums, but if it actually gets read into the model. Um, and also your privacy is how much of your own data is snarfed up, right? And when you think about like your images or whatever and image recognition systems or image generation systems, Pictures that you posted are actually often used to train those kinds of systems, right? The job displacement issues are very clear and people are still are studying that now to get more of a sense for it. Misinformation, right? So all these things have become more heightened because the power tools have allowed not just companies to be able to essentially cause all these issues to happen, but consumers. So that really lets the genie out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think one way, uh, I understand the current moment we're in. Um, in the early days of social media, 
you'll all remember, there was enormous optimism that it was this, this mechanism for amplifying voice of people who didn't previously have a voice. You could become a content creator, an influencer, a kind of profession that really wasn't known before. And then people even thought that it was going to help spread democracy around the world. It was a sort of tool in the hands of people who were going to be agents of social change for the, for, for the good, um, the kind of so-called Twitter revolutions that happened. And then in 2015, 2016, you know, we saw the Russian interference in, in the U.S. election and a whole variety of concerns. And so we went from a kind of techno-utopian orientation to a tech backlash orientation. I want to share that, you know, this even goes back further. Um, Maron uses the idea that you just heard, like, these, te these technologies, AI in particular, are tools that are amplifiers for what humans do. Humans are not always angelic. Um, so when humans do bad things, AI will allow them to do more of the bad things that they're inclined to do. An earlier era thought that AI and digital tools were somehow inherently liberatory or, or they were inherently good for the world. Um, President Reagan said in the 1980s um, that the total, totalitarianism, I think, let me get it right, the, the Goliath of totalitarianism will be taken down by the David of the microchip. Silicon Valley was going to unleash freedom. President Bush, his successor, said, imagine if the internet took hold in China and imagine how freedom would spread. Um, these lovely and naive understandings about the inherent capacities of the technologies. Well, so I think we're now at a moment where we're much wiser about what these tools can allow. We don't think there's anything inherent about them for good or for bad. We should get out of a mode of thinking utopianism or dystopianism. We should think there's enormous good and there's great risk. And we should take an ordinary approach to thinking about the professional norms of people who build the tools to try to contain the risks and policies and regulations. So, you know, a conventional kind of metaphor for all of you would just be to think, when a company builds a car and puts it up for sale, there's an infrastructure of the roadway in which cars are made more safe than they would be otherwise. There's standards in which you release a car to a consumer product. The milk that you buy in a grocery store, the meat that you buy in a grocery store has an inspection process to help impose some minimal safety standards. Um, drug development, you can't decide to tinker in your garage and then like sell your concoction to your neighbor down the street to see if it makes them better. Again, there are just basic sort of safeguards around most consumer products of any consequence. And for, for the immaturity of the profession, I think because technologists have, are relatively developmentally mature, they've thought they're, they're special. They don't need to be subject to these ordinary safeguards. But now we're in a policy moment in which the kind of, you know, U.S. government is waking up, consumers are waking up, and I think there'll just be an ordinary politics in which some basic new norms and regulations evolve. It's not going to happen overnight. It'll be a decade long or more process, but we're in the beginning moments of that. And that's a healthy sign about democracy waking up to take stock of the moment we're in. I'm going to, well, I want to read a quote from the book actually, and it, it goes on this theme. The fiction that innovation simply outruns democracy is no longer tenable. Democracy shares the blame and we need to figure out how to do better. Yeah. Which you're, you're touching on here. Yes. Are we going to do better with AI? You seem optimistic about it, but history does not show. Yes. It, uh, we don't even have a privacy, a federal privacy law. Exactly. Well, um, you know, a, a philosopher like myself is sometimes accused of having an over romantic vision of, of, demo, of democracy. And I, I don't want to indulge in that because, of course, we do have extraordinary dysfunction in our democratic systems. And um, there is a chance that we'll, we in the United States will blow the opportunity we have to install some very modest safeguards or guardrails. And um, our politics right now uh, make it much more difficult to bring about ordinary forms of negotiation and compromise. So I don't want to express optimism about something in the short run. And um, it is true, I think, that there are all kinds of fault lines in democracy that put democracy itself here in the United States at sig significant risk. And technology is not the only reason for that. There are many other reasons on top of it. However, um, when I see 
Um, President Biden, Biden asking for meetings with the CEOs and with people in the universities to talk about artificial intelligence. When I see Lena Khan at the FTC bringing antitrust action against some of the companies, when I see various efforts to try to meet the European Union with its mm -hmm. GDPR regulations from five years ago with some basic privacy standards, different states making moves on privacy laws, um, there's the grass shoots of what you could describe as a kind of ordinary regulatory response. How quickly will it happen? Um, I'm not sure, and a lot depends upon what happens in our actual elections over the next couple of years. But the early signs are there, and I think we should just nurture and champion them. And Mehran, there's, there's, we've also been at an interesting moment where you've had the tech companies, you've had these CEOs embracing some form of regulation. What do you make of that? I mean, should we all think, oh, yeah, they really want all these rules and regulations. This is wonderful. Well, they want some rules and regulations. So at, at one level, we were having a conversation last night about the CEOs of these companies having to make decisions. And the amount of both power and pressure they're under is extreme. And part of the reason why that is is because if someone like uh, Sundar Pinchai has to decide what are the allowable guardrails on a system like BARD that they're going to put in the hands of consumers, right? And he gets that wrong. There's a huge amount of flack for the company. So they're on the hook for that right now. So what they want is regulation to say, hey, government, you tell us what to do and we'll do it basically to take the pressure off so that we don't have to have the right answer. You tell us the right answer. Now, the problem with that, though, and, and we've actually kind of seen this play out a little bit with open AI, right? Sam Altman, who's a former student, student of mine, you know, comes and argues that we need to have more regulation, which is true. But then when the European Union, for example, and the AI Act decides that they want to have some regulations, the folks at OpenAI actually go and argue to weaken those regulations, right? So what they want is a regulation that takes the responsibility away from them, but doesn't necessarily reach a level that they feel interferes with the business model that they want to pursue, the revenue generation that they want to have. And the point with regulation is those you need to take it part and parcel, right? You need to have a regulation that's going to protect the consumer. And that might be something that is further than the companies actually want to go. And if they want to abdicate the responsibility of having to make these decisions, they need to also face those consequences. You see this in generative AI with open AI. You see it in Facebook, right? If you remember Mark Zuckerberg, like two years ago, was saying the government should regulate us, right? Why? Because both the left and the right were saying, you're making the wrong decisions in terms of what information you take off the site. And so he said, fine, take that decision away from us. The government should tell us what to do. Partly with an understanding the government doesn't have an answer there. Right? And I think that's one of the things we also need to think about is people oftentimes look for the point solution. How are you going to solve this problem? And we're, we need it solved tomorrow, right? And the reality is it's not going to be solved tomorrow. As Rob mentioned, this is going to be a years long process. And the place we need to start is not with the hardest problems, but the easiest mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is it builds up the regulatory muscle. It builds up the ability of lawmakers to address these issues. So like privacy actually is a lower hanging fruit. We actually have models for how to do that. We have it in California. We have it Illinois, the European Union has a model. All those things triangulated could actually make a nice federal policy. That's low-hanging fruit. That doesn't solve the problems with generative AI, but it says if we can do these kinds of things, if government can take some action to begin with, it builds their muscles, and it gives us actual more hope to believe they can solve the bigger problems down the line. I'm going to go to audience questions soon, but I want to end with on my questions with thinking about us in the audience and, and us as users of technology. How many here may have heard about AI over the last couple of days and wanted to hide under their bed? <laughs> How many did hide under their bed in their, yeah. their hotel room? Uh -huh. Okay, good. My, I have a king size bed, you can come to my room. <laughs> you guys do touch on in the book yeah. what we can do, yeah. citizens can do. Mm -hmm. What can we do in this age of AI and as big tech companies keep getting bigger, all of us, what can we do? Yeah, uh, all of us have a couple different identities. We're, we're, all of us are citizens of some jurisdiction or another. Um, all of us are users in some form or fashion of these various tools. And all of us um, um, have a voice in both of those particular domains. And all, for many of us, we also have occupations that give us some, some potential way of either 
affecting the business decisions that the companies we work for make with respect to the adoption of these technologies, um, or if we're technologists of the very development and deployment of them. And so um, the thing that we're really keen to, to put to everyone is we want to try to lift up the agency of every single person so that no one believes that technology is some type of gravitational force that is just exerting itself on us and we either try to avoid it or somehow just be sucked up into it. Um, and there's a tendency in the tech companies sometimes to say, look, we built the product and you can use it as it is according to the terms that we, we have decided or your choice user is then just decide not to use the product if you don't want to. Like delete Facebook if you don't like Facebook. Tell your kids not to use Snapchat or TikTok. Um, and instead, I think having an orientation towards shaping the actual technology itself in the modest ways we can as citizens by putting pressure on our various elected representatives, by trying to find ways to um, um, develop new ways of building the tools themselves. Um, I, I'll give you one more metaphor for this that I, I, I got from, from Maron at one point, which is uh, imagine if um, in the early days of the deployment of the automobile, um, the car companies had said, look, you know, these are dangerous devices, you know, with humans at the, at the wheel, the cars themselves work pretty well, but they're not always perfectly safe. And, you know, it's better than horse carriages. Uh, it gets you places more quickly. Um, but we don't want any regulation, like no literal guardrails on the roads, no stoplights, no speed limits, no, no, no imposed regulations. Um, use the car if you want, drive responsibly, and if you don't like it, then just don't buy a car. <laughs> now, the appropriate response to that would be that's a ridiculous position to put a user in. Um, there are all kinds of ordinary things that we can do to build a safer infrastructure, and we did that for automobiles. We did that for drug development. We did that for stuff in the grocery store, and now is the time for all of us to express our wishes to do that in the digital age. And we're at the early moments of that. And maybe just to follow on to Rob's point, and something to consider is that narrative of it's your personal responsibility in your interaction with, with technology really is a, is a red herring, right? You don't get inoculated to the effect of Facebook on our democracy because you don't use Facebook. You're not immune to the de labor impact and the labor distribution and displacement of generative AI tools if you don't use ChatGPT. So what this requires is not individual decisions around do I use the technology or not. That's not going to solve the problem for anyone. What we need is a systematic approach. That systematic approach often requires regulation to say this is a societal impact problem. It's not just an individual impact problem. And so you need to solve it at a societal level, not just an individual level. We can go to some audience questions if we, we have any. We'd start over here and then come back over here. I know there's microphone runners there. Great. Right into the okay. Um, you seem very confident or at least hopeful about government reg regulation that's starting now. But what I've been saying is that with the polarization, I feel like political decisions are taking longer. And with technology and especially AI, change and innovation is happening exponential like we've never seen before. Yep. So doesn't that scare you? <laughs> Yes, I mean, there's a familiar pattern in which on the frontier of science and technology, you know, the usual pattern is within a university dedicated to basic research, some type of novel discovery is made. Then later it gets translated and the, you know, private investment comes in, build small companies, the things that begin to show up in terms of products. And then the, the marketplace begins to mature and there's a concentration and the sort of market shakes out. And then now that the products are being used at scale, um, um, we become aware of the harms. That's the moment we're in with technology at the moment, digital technology. Is Washington DC in certain respects broken? Yes, but the stakes here are high enough that I wanna think that the ordinary 
um, response of government, of democratic government, is going to kick in at some level. So I'm hopeful, maybe not optimistic, but I'm not going to like give you a probability. But I think the pa historical pattern is clear to see. If you go back to the age of television and radio, or even before that, the introduction of railroads as a new technology, government intervention to install regulatory safeguards to try to create a level playing field so that all companies had to abide by certain minimal standards is a pretty commonplace thing. And in AI, the stakes are high enough because people often describe this not just as a consumer issue about harms to consumers for your privacy is being abused, but as a geopolitical issue. This is a competition now with China. These um, um, tools are so powerful that they might even threaten existential risks to humanity itself. Um, and so if you get people in the US government saying, if these new super powerful AI models could be used by our adversaries to develop novel pathogens for bioterrorism, and so this is a national security issue, that's going to arrest the attention of people in the government, as it should. Um, what the response is going to be yet is still unknown, but I think there's jockeying for position. As I said, the FTC, Lena Khan is already doing some work there, Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, Office of Science and Technology Policy. You see all, all kinds of sort of initial um, interagency competition, a, a phrase I've only learned recently since I'm not a DC person. Uh, and I don't want to predict success, but you see the kind of early moments of what will come to be a, a debate around responsible regulatory standards. And I think that's pretty standard over the course of history. And maybe just a quick comment about speed to add to that, because I think one of the things people worry about is regulation can't keep up with how quickly the technology is changing. I think the thing to keep in mind is you don't want to regulate the technology, you want to regulate the outcome, and the outcome is based on values. So you can say something like, there's going to be a bunch of different technologies that make decisions about people, what healthcare you should get, your, whether you get bail in the criminal justice system, what housing you, you can be allocated to. Those are going to continue to change over time. The outcome you want to ensure is that those systems are fair for some notion of fair. They don't discriminate based on gender. They don't discriminate based on race or age, a bunch of different protected characteristics. When you understand what those things are, you can have regulation that is about the output of the technology that's produced. And that regulation has a more, I wouldn't say completely timeless, but has more of a timeless feel to it than if you're just trying to keep up with regulating every new technology that comes out. It's time for you two to go to D.C. <laughs> it's not as nice there, but uh, Michael, we can go. Hi. So we've already started to see some lawsuits emerge against OpenAI. Right. right. If the regulatory infrastructure can't move fast enough, can we solve this problem through litigation? Yeah, good. So um, um, let, let's get a little wonky on the technology now. So. Um, Generative AI, these open AI tools that create images or create text or multimodal things like video and a combination of all of it, um, are going to be different from a legal standpoint than the age of social media. So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act puts a sort of legal immunity around platforms on the internet or apps that host user-generated content. If you create a photo on Facebook, on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, if it violates some law, the the company that hosts it is not legally liable. Now, because, because of generative AI, the company's own model is what's generating the content. So it's very unlikely that the outputs from DALI or ChatGPT will be subject to Section 230. And so, as you say, there are a bunch of lawsuits happening. Um, can you scrape the entire web taking copyrighted images from Getty, for example, which does photos, of course, and has a great business selling the rights to them, that the, the exact photo won't be output by DALI, but it will be, have been used to train the model that generates more photos. Um, there's a legal question about whether or not OpenAI is breaking any copyright laws by having trained their model on copyrighted images. There's a variety of other things that are going to be tested as well. So you might have read that Apple has recently banned the use of OpenAI's tools for its internal employees because when you put the prompt in, OpenAI has access to the prompt. And if, open AI, if Apple employees are typing in various things that talk about Apple products, now OpenAI in principle has access to that. So maybe there are privacy issues with respect to um, how these generative AI models are, are being used. And then there's a, an, an even further thing, uh, which is about um, imagine if the models are trained on various things that aren't copyrighted, but then the prompt says something like, Give me an image in the mode of, an, of a Warhol painting. Now, um, 
the models can do that pretty reliably with well-known artists, but is that itself now an intellectual property issue where in order to output something in the mode of a particular artist, the artist's estate should get some cut of the revenue or at least have the permission to opt in or opt out. That's going to be tested as well. So there are all kinds of legal things that are at the forefront now that will work themselves through the system. They will put some sand in the gears right now of the move fast and break things because the potential liability could in fact be very large. I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an intellectual property or copyright person, but I will say I think that there, um, it won't be quite like Section 230 and total legal immunity. There are going to be some new standards that emerge, is my prediction. Uh, right here. Uh, hi, I'm Gaylene. Um, my husband Michael and I talk about AI all the time. We are in tech in San Francisco and are surrounded by this. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for this discussion. This has been the most sane discussion around AI for the Not whole for festival. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and I, would, I, I, I would agree. I would agree. There's so much fear that we get questions from friends saying, oh my gosh, should I be hiding under the bed? So I guess the thing I want to ask is, um, is there something that we as citizens, rather than the corporations that don't really have the motivation, or the government that I agree is potentially too fractured to bring in legislation quickly, although there's the litigation angle, is there something that we all can do with a, a combined voice, which I don't think really has a parallel in any other movement in the past, but can we do something to tampen down the fear, look optimistically at what it can do, and you know, bring a more sane voice to what AI can do for us. Well, you know, to start with, I think some of the discussions that have that have been going on. Some people refer to the the AI doomers and the AI boomers, right? And they're either the people that's like AI is going to kill us all, enjoy it while you have it, or AI is going to solve all of our problems for you, so don't worry about it. And and the middle ground is somewhere in between. And but part of the discussion of that middle ground, which is what I think citizens need to engage in, are what are the ways that it impacts us? What are the values that we care about that it's going to promote or it's going to denigrate? Um, now that translates, if you want to, that to translate into action, there's a few ways that it translates into action. One way it is the, you call your representative, you try to take a more collective action. But there's a bunch of things you can do at a personal level too. It, the personal level is not going to solve the problem, but at least it, it uh, gets you a little bit more removed from the system, right? So if you w set your privacy settings, for example, in your browser or in the different apps that you use. Now, this is one of those things that GDPR tried to set, right? When you go to websites now, you get all these quick cookie pop-ups if you've dealt with those things. You can thank the General Data Protection Regulation for that. The problem is people have just become desensitized to it, right? In the early days, you f saw the first couple and you're like, oh, I can set my privacy. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to set all these settings, right? And by the third one, you're like, come on, I just want to see the cat video. Just show it to me, <laughs> right? But this is a choice on the standpoint of the companies that build browsers. There's no reason technologically why you couldn't set those settings once and every site you go to would have to respect those settings, right? That's a choice by the people who make the browsers and it's a choice by the companies that have the websites that want to be able to gather your data, right? Neither one of them has an incentive to essentially protect your privacy. So those are places, again, where you can demand for it or you can make choices around the products that you use. So there's actually some browsers that will try to enforce more of your privacy. There's apps like DuckDuckGo, for example, that try to gather less information about you than some of the other search engines. I say that as someone who spent the better part of a decade working at Google, <laughs> right? So you got to take the good with the bad. But those are some of the things that require more individual awareness of what the possibilities are to chase after them. But again, I would go back to the point that I don't think that's going to be enough to solve the big problems. Well, I got, just got some new column ideas, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Something came out of it. Yeah. Uh, we have time. Yeah, we have time for two more questions. We'll do these two here and we'll wrap up. So uh, in terms of the regulations that will eventually evolve, and I do see that as being a slow process, um, do you see collaboration amongst all the companies that need this regulation? Will they work together and cooperate? And do you also see people like yourselves with the kinds of knowledge and capabilities joining with the government to give the government the ability? You pointed out, you know, uh, some yeah. of the hearings, we know that the governmental people don't really know a lot sure. about this, but maybe some of the people in the agencies do. So where will the expertise come to create the collaboration and the 
the political will and yeah. the ability to make these regulations happen. Yes, good. I mean, I, I think the, the, the efforts of people from within the tech industry, not to lobby government or to um, try to pressure government to give it the most industry-friendly regulations, but rather to work in tandem with or have a dynamic with government about the evolution of regulations from DC with the necessary technical tools that need to be developed themselves that no one in Washington is going to develop even if they are knowledgeable about technology. Um, that's the interplay that I think will be a productive one. Let me give you a concrete example of that. So. There's a hot debate happening right now about um, deep fakes and, and the ways in which these generative AI tools can create things where we can't tell whether they're produced by a human and manipulated in various ways. And when I think, you know, the move fast and break thing, so OpenAI's ChatGPT was released in late November of 2022. And every single teacher across the entire world had to adapt to the release of this tool and now has to have a policy on their syllabus about the use of these tools for turning in essays or doing assignments. It's not just essay writing, it's also coding. And this is a classic example of my mind in moving fast and breaking things in the sense that it would have been possible for OpenAI to have delayed the release of ChatGPT so that it could have released it along with a watermarking technical tool, a kind of authentication device for anything that's generated by the tool, which wouldn't have then dumped on the back of unprepared teachers the whole responsibility for adapting to the, the moment. Now, Washington DC could pass a law that said, any generative AI tool has to have a watermarking process. But the watermarking process is a technical development that can't just be legislated into existence. So that's what I have in mind by this happy interplay between mm -hmm. regulatory efforts that say, you better get moving dear industry on certain things that are common tools and standards for all of the products you're developing that will require your technologists to get to work, not just policymakers to lobby us. And that I think will be a healthy process. I'll give you one more example. Um, facial recognition tools, which are now so ubiquitous. Lots of different companies have one by one standards, Microsoft, for example, Amazon. They will not sell facial recognition tools to local police departments for any use so that they're trying to um, prevent you know, police officers from having um, facial recognition device for anyone who happens to walk by them at any given moment. And those companies pride themselves on their ethical practice of not just handing this out, um, even if they can make a profit from it. But Clearview AI, another company, is very happy to sell its facial recognition tools to local police departments, and they do so. So from a social standpoint, we are no better off with Microsoft and Amazon having these nice standards. This is why we need industry-wide standards, and that will come in about in dynamic relationship to regulatory pressures that evolve. There was one last question over here. Um, I was telling Professor Sahami yesterday that um, on my commute from San Francisco to San Jose for work, I listen and watch the YouTube videos that you guys teach. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I read this lovely article by Tech Chang in New Yorker the other day titled, Will AI Become the New McKinsey? Mm -hmm. And there's one line um, that really struck me that says people tend to conflate AI or technology with capitalism and progress. Yeah. So I have a two-part question. One is on capitalism, another big word we need, we are talking around. Um, we have optimization and scale and all the problems with it because it is incentivized by capitalism. So how do we reform incentives mm -hmm. for the outcomes we want? And two, progress. We have unarticulated notions of progress baked into the way we are pursuing the benefits of tech. And it requires philosophers and uh, ethics and a normative discussion on notions of progress that we really want to have. And it doesn't feel like we're talking at a normative level at all. Mm -hmm. How far away are we from that in order to have regulations that reflect notions of progress that are good for us? Yeah. 
Fantastic. Well, um, you teed up the philosophy question for a philosophy <laughs> professor, so I couldn't be happier about it. Um, even though, of course, now we're treading into difficult and deep waters. Um, how do we think about the, the role that capitalism plays um, in all of the technology that we see? How do we think about progress itself? Let me give you, um, everyone else, another example about uh, where I think this is so important. So for those of you who follow economics and global development, um, the chief kind of measure that we've used in many different places across the world for the past 50 or 60 years about economic growth is GDP, gross domestic product, a kind of measure developed by economists to try to figure out the sum total of output uh, um, of, of any particular country. Um, it's an imperfect measure, which economists would be happy to acknowledge, um, but there are many different ways of trying to measure progress, economic progress, that don't rely on GDP, that incorporate a bunch of different markers or different ind indices, like, for example, maternal health standards um, or um, the ability of people to uh, um, have longer lives that are on balance good lives at the end of their lives. Those any ordinary person would see as that should count as progress too, but maternal health and long life where you're still um, healthy don't typically show up in ordinary measures of GDP. So that's another example of how we can take a notion of progress and try to develop better measures to account for it. And we should do that also with the tech industry in various ways, not just the, the latest sort of, you know, G. Willikers type of, of things. Oh, look, you can get a cute cat. Yeah, we can make a cat video too. We, you know, tick, the, the TikTokification, of, if you wish, of, of our tech lives. Um, this is a conversation that I think is going to be essential at, at a social level that will not, not be necessarily led by our democratic institutions that will be filtered into it. And I'll add one more, you know, sort of hopeful slash ominous note, I think the same thing will be prompted by conversations about climate change because that's the same things are at stake in climate. And so we're reaching a kind of civilizational level conversation about how to think about capitalism and progress and the very survival of the planet. Yeah, if I could add one point, too, about thinking about the incentives, because this topic always comes up in our class. Like, we talk about the class, we talk about these issues in ethics and technology, and invariably at some point, like halfway through the class, someone raises their hand and says, isn't this all a problem with capitalism, right? And th at that point, we sort of unpack some things about political economy, which is kind of a new unit we've added to the class. But one of the things to think about is ways that you can incentive align the behavior you want with a capitalist structure. So we don't argue you get rid of capitalism. What we say is, what are the levers you have to move in that system to create a greater alignment with what you want? I'll give you a simple example. Right now, one of the things that's actually a huge issue when we think about automation is labor displacement. And one of the problems with that is that economic incentives right now basically incentivize replacing people with technology. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when you replace people with technology, there's no payroll tax for technology. There is for a human being. What does that mean when you eliminate the payroll tax? It also means you eliminate less money going into social programs that are basically trying to lift everyone up. So you actually get all of these percolating effects. So one of the things you can do, which astoundingly enough was actually suggested by folks like Bill Gates and others, so it's not something coming from the fringe, it's actually coming from the core of the technology industry, is you tax the automation. Right? And so that actually creates a disincentive to just say, I'm going to replace my human workers with automation. It forces you to make a much more deliberate decision to say, am I going to get greater productivity here? Is it worth the cost? What is the impact to human beings? Mm -hmm. And only when we are forced to make those kind of value trade-offs, still within a capitalist system, but when we are incentive aligned to think about how do we preserve some of the things we want, like human dignity and the labor force, those are the places where we can actually get some outcomes we care about without changing the whole system. Wonderful. Kitty, do you have that one last question? Are we good? I thought that was a pretty good end, but I mean, my question was going to go back to the election because we're talking a little bit about longer term yep. um, ways to manage. And I'm, we're already seeing and actually addressed this week, you know, with a funny title of Pope in the Puffer Jacket, but we're already seeing deep fakes in right. video. I mean, the watermarking idea is the only one that you mentioned that I could see being able to be worthy by next summer, but I, I'm just curious how you're reflecting on how AI is really going to distort public opinion with misinformation. It just makes me, that's what makes me want to hide under the bed. Mm -hmm. 
the, uh, these issues of disinformation, and, and in particular adversarial uses, so it's not just the sort of accidental dissemination of things that happen to be false or misleading, but the deliberate injection of deep fake content in, into our either election environment or just the more new general information environment. So t the technical way to begin thinking about watermarking, provenance, authentication, these are things that can get up and working and they'll be accelerated, the development of them will be accelerated if there's threat, threats of, of regulation from DC. Another approach would be um, if, take the Pope with the, uh, the, puff, the puffer jacket, um, if an, the actual image of someone is used in a way that's a deep fake, whether it's for advertising or information purposes, um, just as one can sue a newspaper for libel, if there's legal liability for the host of the, of the, uh, of the deep fake, that's another way to think about it. You don't need to stop the deep fake producer. What you need is to stop the dissemination vehicle. And if you hold the dissemination vehicle, the platform legally liable for disseminating a deep fake, maybe that's another approach. And that, again, this is not like new regulatory standards. It's just legal liability will be a sufficient threat to um, accelerate the development of technologies to try to um, minimize or eliminate this. Uh, I don't want to say I'm hopeful about it, but the fact that we're all talking about it is, is a sign of the seriousness of the issue, and the election is going to be a forcing function for people to take this even more seriously. So um, I think there will be serious efforts made in the next six months prior to the run-up to the 2024 election to try to um, at least mitigate some of the most harmful consequences of this. We'll leave it there. You guys were wonderful. Thank you, Rob. Thank, Thank you, Ron. You. Thank you. Thank you.